had prepared well. We'd had all of our orders. We had about a 10 mile advance to contact through the night. We formed up at the bottom of Mount Longdon. B Company was my company. We were the lead company to take the ridge of Mount Longdon. We, we had a lot of youngsters in our company. I remember distinctly our company sergeant major, Johnny Weeks, at the bottom of the mountain, got us almost all in single file and asked us to fix bayonets, which was very bizarre, almost going back to your childhood, looking at those war films from the 1960s you'd seen. Did he just say fix bayonets? Then he said, and I suggest you have a little prayer as well, boys. And that was really when he hit home. We were going up there. We were going into battle. So from the beginning to the end of the actual hand-to-hand -hand fighting, it was probably about a good 12, 14 hours before the fullback position was actually taken. Of which in the meantime, we lost 23 fellas dead and over 50 wounded. I was hit. I got fired at from an angle coming across from my back, left out from my right, from a position that we'd overlooked. I got shot through right by the base of my spine, and it came out of me through my hip. What it did, unfortunately, it missed all my bones, but it had hit my sciatic nerve on the way through, and that's what had caused disruption, and I couldn't, for the life of me, get back on my feet to do anything. Some of mates of mine who cursed and lambasted me for being a lazy oik, laying around and hugging with the limelight. They lobbed me some blankets from cover and lobbed me them to keep me warm. And I lay under there for all these hours. They got me singing because they said to me, Don't go to sleep. Whatever you do, don't go to sleep because you get hypothermic. Don't pee yourself. And I was gagging for a pee. They said, Don't do that. It will bring on hypothermia quicker. They got me to sing songs to stay conscious. One of the most poignant things for me was really weirdly the choice of song. I was into the Stranglers big time, as well as Mascara and stuff like that. And so I was singing a lot of Stranglers songs and everything. There's a battle going on up ahead. This is absolutely true. Golden Brown had just come out. I'd already been to see them down the Rainbow Theatre. Massive fan of them. So I was singing Stranglers songs. Then moved on to, weirdly enough, change of tempo. And as I got more and more hacked off, Simon and Garfunkel. I knew they was really taking the mig when they started shouting out requests from cover. You know what I mean? I thought, bloody hell. It was it was like pre-karaoke days. So at the time it was, you hum it, I'll strum it. <laughs> but they were very true. And joking aside, that's what gets you through it. Just little things like that, you know? At each point I kept thinking, I ain't gonna get out of this. I ain't gonna get out of this. That period where we were all lying out front, it was Kev Eaton, Simon Clark, Mushrooms Bateman. They'd all been shot, incapacitated, couldn't move, and they were in the same position as myself. I was lying slightly to their left. was a strange place because it looked very much like my homeland on the west coast of Scotland. Very few trees, shitty peat smell in the air. You get all four seasons in one day. I didn't really know where it was, if I was honest. It said, you're on Sir Lancelot, you'll be transferred to Galahad, and Tristram. Every ship I went on got blown up, so it wasn't a good day out. On the 21st of May, we landed in San Carlos water. It was all quite exciting. We engaged our weapons and found out there was loads of cows on the top of the hill that were running away because the night sights weren't that good. So poor cows, but we'd won the war already. We landed and there was one error after the other. We were six hours too early. So we knew things go wrong in war. Unfortunately, within about two hours of daylight, we had our first of very many air attacks. That was exciting. People call it fear, the adrenaline, the buzz. It's phenomenal. When someone, enemy aircraft, are doing 600 knots by your left or right ear, chucking thousand pounders at you. There's no other word for it. It's absolutely buzzing. You're in survival mode. Fight, flight, freeze or fold. My impressions were, is this really what war was like? But we hadn't seen any bad stuff till then. 
Within that first day, we had seen some navy ships sunk, and my impression as a young man was, these planes can go fast, and awful fast, so we need to change our tactics. We put armor piercing and tracer in, so we could see roughly, and we'd fire in front of them. The biggest impact was probably on the 8th of June. A ship got bombed, Sir Lancelot. So even though we abandoned ship, we went back and stayed on it, because it was dry and it was warm. There was only three UXBs on board, so unexploded bombs. If they're going to go off, they'll go off. If they don't, they don't. We've become quite blasé. Then we got cross deck to Sir Tristram, and then we went round on Sir Tristram with our raft through a minefield, and we started unloading. And the locals? They brought all the tractors down because the landing sites were pretty poor. We had to get artillery ammunition ashore quickly. Unfortunately, the cloud cover cleared. So Galahad ran in and the Argentinians from the mountains went, there's two big grey ships there and they're not protected. That was the most significant point and probably the start of my post-traumatic stress. Within four minutes, we had 55 killed and 138 injured. It's the burning. We had waterproofs then that would melt into you. We didn't have good kit. That was the most significant time. And as a young Lance Corporal, I had to go out and rescue some of these guys. We rescued over 100 people. There was an eerie feeling. It really was. And there was like... No kids, there was no people, there were no cars. Not even a dog on the streets. Because the dogs, when they saw you, they just went for your ankles anyway. And to me then, yeah, this is strange. It's a combat indicator that something could be up there. The way they ended up, they were in front of me. And they were probably from no more than like 20 meters away. 20 yards away from me and Dougie started coming, pulling across. As soon as they hit the junction of the two sorts of alleys, just the whole place just lit up and boom. At the time, there was the bang. The flash and the bang to be honest, you do see the flash first and the boss was lying on the ground. I remember Ducky coming in. I grabbed the radio and we grabbed a piece each of his chest rig and we grabbed him out of the way and just the trail of blood. Your training has kicked in, your medical skills have kicked in and they say after three, what do you call them? First three dressings straight to the tourniquet, so it was one and it was soaked, two, three, within a matter, and it wasn't even a minute and the three dressings were soaked through with blood, and it was just a rifle sling off, bang, tourniquet, getting patched up. It severed his femoral artery, and at the time we weren't aware of the full damage. So at the time, there was just that buzz feeling, a massive adrenaline rush. We got to the hospital. He went into the emergency ward to get treated right away, and they just brought us. We'd no physical injuries, but the nurse said, go in there and get yourselves cleaned up. I wasn't aware of the state I was in. My hands had blood on them. I hadn't looked in the mirror at this stage. I was just starting to wipe clean my hands, and then I looked into the mirror, and just my face was plastered fully in blood. Next thing, I was woken up on a bed. I just boom. I just capped it. And at the end of the adrenaline rush, probably at the same time, and big massive down, I just flicked it. I was out cold. My maid got hit with an ID right in front of me in February 2010. He stood on a wooden ID and lost both of his legs. I was a cat C casualty and I got hit in the face with a sharp nail. We've seen a lot of action, we've seen a lot of contacts, and we've seen a lot of IDs. I dug one up in fact with my tractor, and it didn't uh, just go off because it was wet. I seen it hanging off and just reversed off. Then, it just got to February. And my mate, he just stood on one. A wooden ID. Can't even find it with a metal detector. 
so that was quite hard. At the end of the tour, we went back to Germany, and it was just like the compression, and quite chilled out for the first couple of months. I can't really remember what we trained for, or if anything else came off to be honest. The compression from Afghanistan, it's like winding down from it. It takes months to wind down, to be honest. I can't remember the in-between stuff, I got all sorts of blanks, to be honest. When I went to Afghanistan, I always had an interest in history and places and things, so I was blown away by how nice it was actually as a country. There are some beautiful places out there. I remember when we landed, it was coming to the end of winter. There were sandstorms that would come rolling in. There was thunderstorms, and you could quite see them form a trail across the sky. I just remember how beautiful it was, and I was quite saddened that there was actually a war going out there, you know. But I'd say we were there to do a job. That was what I was trying to focus on. We had prepared well, we'd had our, all of our orders, we had about a 10 mile advance to contact uh, through the night. We formed up at the bottom of Mount Longdon. B Company was my company, we were the lead company to take the ridge off Mount Longdon. We had a lot of the youngsters that I spoke about earlier in the film in our company. I remember distinctly our company sergeant major Johnny Weeks. Um, at the bottom of the mountain got us almost all in single file and asked us to uh, fix bayonets which was a very bizarre um, sort of almost going back to your childhood looking at those films from the 1960s that you'd seen and did he just say fix bayonets of which then he said uh, and I suggest you have a little prayer as well boys because and that was really when it hit home, we're going up here. We're going into into battle. So from beginning to end of the actual hand-to-hand -hand fighting, it's probably about a good 12, 14 hours before uh, the, the fallback was taken, uh, of which in the meantime, um, we'd lost 23 fellas dead and uh, over 50 wounded. I was hit, I, I got fired at from an, uh, an angle coming across from my back left out to my right from a position that was we'd overlooked. And I got shot through right by the base of the spine and it came out my hip. And what it did, unfortunately, it missed all my bones, but it had hit my sciatic nerve on the way through and that's what had caused this rupture and I couldn't, for the life of me, get back on my feet or do anything. Some mates of mine who uh, cursed and lambasted me for being a lazy oik laying around and uh, hogging all the bat They lobbed me some blankets from cover and lobbed me them to keep me warm. Um, and I had uh, laid under there uh, for all these hours. They got me singing because they said to me, don't go to sleep. What do you do? Don't go to sleep because you get hypothermic. Don't pee yourself. And I was gagging for a pee. So don't, don't do that. It will bring on hypothermia quicker. They got me to sing songs. Uh, they got me. Uh, one of the most point, important things for me was really weirdly my the choice of song. I was in the Stranglers big time as well as me, as well as me um, Scar and stuff like that. And so I was singing a lot of Stranglers songs and everything. It's about going on over here. It's absolutely true. Um, Golden Brown had just come out. Um, I'd already been to see him down the uh, Rainbow Theatre and seen that. Wonderful, uh, massive fan of them, singing Strangler songs. And then moved on to, weirdly enough, change the tempo. And as I got more and more hacked off, 
I'm not Simon, Simon and Garfunkel. I knew they was really taking a mick, like, when they started shouting out requests from Fly Half, you know what I mean? Like, I thought, bloody hell, you know. And it was like pre-karaoke days at the time, like, was, yeah, you am it, old strum it. And, <laughs> so, but they were very true members. And, and that, I mean, Joe, so that's what gets you through that, just little things like that, you know. The Falklands was a strange place because it looked very much like my homeland on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, very few trees, uh, shitty peat smell in the air. Uh, again, you get all four seasons in one day. Uh, I didn't really know where it was, if I was honest. They said, you're on to Lancelot and you'll be transferred to Galahad and Tristram. And every ship I went on got blown up, so it wasn't a good day out. Uh, so. On the 21st of May, we landed in San Carlos water. Uh, it was all quite exciting. We engaged our weapons and found out there was a load of cows on the top of the hill that were running away because our night sights weren't that good. Uh, so, you know, poor cows. <laughs> but we'd won the war already. Uh, <laughs> we landed and there was uh, one error after the other. We were six hours too early. Uh, so we knew things go wrong in war. Uh, unfortunately, within about two hours of daylight, we had our first of very many air attacks. And that was exciting. Uh, people call it fear. People, at the adrenaline, the buzz is phenomenal. When someone is doing 600 knots by your left or right ear, chucking thousand pounders at you, there is no other word for it. It is absolutely buzzing. You're in survival mode. Fight, flight, freeze or fold. My impressions were, is this really what war's like? But we hadn't seen any bad stuff. But within that first day, we had seen some Navy ships sunk. And, you know, and my impression as a young man was, these, these, uh, these planes can go fast and awful fast, so we need to change our tactics. So we put armoured piercing and tracer in so we could see roughly and we'd fire in front of them. The biggest impact was probably on the 8th of June. Uh, my ship got bombed, so Lancelot, so even though we abandoned ship, we went back on and stayed on her because it was dry and it was warm. And, and the, there was only three UXBs on board, so unexploded bombs, are, if they're going to go off, they'll go off. If they don't, they don't. You became quite blasé. Uh, and then we got cross-decked to Sir, Sir Tristram and then we went round on Sir Tristram with our raft through a minefield and we started unloading and the locals, uh, they, they brought all the tractors down because the landing sites were pretty poor and we had to get artillery ammunition ashore quickly. And unfortunately, the cloud cover cleared and Sir Galahad ran in and the Argentinians from the mountains went, ah, there's two big grey ships there and they're not protected. So that was the most significant point, and probably the start of post-traumatic stress. Uh, within four minutes, we had 55 killed and 138 injured, and it's the burning that we had waterproofs then that would melt into you. You know, we didn't have good kit. Uh, that was the most significant time. And as a young lands corporal, I had to go out and rescue some of these guys, and we rescued over 100 people. There was an airy feeling, really was, and it was like there was no kids, there was no people, there was no cars, everything, was, not even a dog on the street because the dogs when they seen you just fucking always went for your ankles anyway. And to me then, yeah, this is strange. It's a combat indicator, something could be up here. The way it ended up, they were in front of me and they were probably from... Like no more than 20 metres away, 20 yards away from me, and Doogie started coming pulling across. As soon as they hit the, the junction of the two sort of alleys, just in place, just lit, and boom. At the time, it was like the bang, the flash in the bang, to be honest. You do see the flash first. And the boss was laying on the ground. I remember Doogie coming in. I grabbed the radio, and we grabbed a piece, each of his chest rig, and we dragged them out of the way, and just the trail of blood. Your training has kicked in, your, your sort of medical skills have kicked in, and they say after three, um, what do you call them, first few dressings, 
it's straight to a tourniquet. Yeah. So it was one, and it was soaked two, three. Within within a matter, it wasn't even a minute, and the three feed dressings were soaked through with blood. And it was just rifle string, a rifle sling off, bang, tourniquet, and get him patched up. It severed his femoral artery. Right. And at the time, we weren't aware of yeah. the full damage. So at the time, there was just a ma- just that buzz feeling, yeah. adrenaline rush. And we got to the hospital. He went into the emergency ward to get treated right away. And they brought us, we had no, we had no physical, mm-hmm. physical injuries, but the wee nurse said, go use in there, get yourselves cleaned up. I wasn't aware of what state I was in. When I started, I hadn't looked in the mirror at this stage, and it's just starting to wipe, clean my hands, and then I looked in the mirror, and just my face was just plastered, fully in blood. And next thing, I was woke up on a bed. I just, boom, I just coped it. And that was the end of the adrenaline rush, probably yeah. at the same yeah. time. Like where you go, overloaded on adrenaline. Yeah. And you've got to go down. The big massive sleep. down. And yeah. it just, I flaked that I was out cold. Yeah, my mate got hit with an IED right in front of me in, fe- in February 2010. He stood on a wooden IED and lost both his legs. And I was a cat sea casualty. I-, I got hit in the face with shrapnel. And we'd seen a lot of action, we'd seen a lot of contacts, and we'd seen a lot of IEDs. I dug one up, in fact, with a trap with my tractor. It just didn't go off because it was wet. I was just had seen it hanging off and just reversed off. Um, and then it was just, it got to February and he just stood on one. Just with an IED, can't even find it with the metal detectors. So that was quite hard. And you, then you came to the end of that tour. Mm-hmm. Where, where did you go from there? Uh, went back to Germany and it was just like, it was like decompression and sort of quite chilled out for the first couple of months. I can't really remember what we trained for or if, if anything else came up, to be honest. What was decompression, Dean? Just like um, decompression from Afghanistan. It's like it's like winding down from it. It takes months to wind down, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, can't, I can't remember the in-between stuff between after that sort of, sort of blank, to be honest. When I went to Afghanistan, the, the f- I, like I've always had uh, um, an interest in history and, and places and things so I was I was um, blown away by how nice it was actually of the country um, you know there's some beautiful places out there I remember when when we landed it was coming to the end of winter so there was sandstorms that would come rolling in there was um, thunderstorms that and, and you could see the thunder trail across the sky I just mem- remember how beautiful it was and uh, I was quite saddened that there was actually a war going on there to, if, if anything you know um, but I'd say we were there to to do a job and, and that's kind of what I was trying to focus on.